Hi, I'm Mr. Loomis. Welcome back for our second lesson about the 1920s. Today is going to be a lot of fun because we're learning about popular culture. It's time for TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, or the pre-internet and cell phone versions. Let's get started by previewing our topics. In the days before television and internet, radio was king, and radio was born in the 1920s. We'll also talk about how radio helped make popular culture spread across the country, influencing things like sports, fads or trends. We'll learn about the first movies, the beginning of jazz music, and how the 1920s made the teenage life that you know possible. And we'll finish off by taking a look at art and architecture. Let's get started with the story of radio. Radio in America had a simple start. Frank Conrad was an engineer for Westinghouse and set up a low-quality radio station in Pittsburgh. This wireless radio was created by Guglielmo Macroni in the late 19th century. Thousands of people across the world tried his new toy. Conrad began broadcasting from his station. High school music groups sang, records were played, and news and baseball scores were reported. Conrad improved the transmitter, and soon hundreds of people in the Pittsburgh area asked for airtime. Leaders at Westinghouse saw Conrad's success and got him to use his radio station to make money. On the night of November 2nd, 1920, Conrad told his listeners that Warren G. Harding had won the election for president. The message was heard as far north as New Hampshire and as far south as Louisiana. The federal government gave the call letters KDKA to the Pittsburgh station and a new industry was born. For nearly a year, KDKA was the only radio station on the air. However, others quickly copied the idea. By the end of 1922, there were over 500 such stations across the United States. The federal government did not do anything to control the new radio stations. Stations fought over call letters and frequencies, each trying to use more power to block the signal of other stations. Finally, in 1927, Congress created the Federal Radio Commission to set rules for the new stations. One of the great things about radio was that once a radio was bought, radio was free. Stations made money by selling airtime to companies for advertisements. Business people could reach millions of listeners at once. By the end of the 1920s, companies were paying over $10,000 for an hour of time on the evenings when many people listened to the radio. The power of radio further sped up the process of nationalization and homogenization that were previously begun with the wide distribution of newspapers made possible by railroads and telegraphs. Far more effectively than its print media, however, radio created and pumped out American culture into the airwaves and into the homes and families around the country. Radio Corporation of America, RCA, did something new in 1926. By licensing telephone lines, RCA created America's first radio network. They called it the National Broadcasting Company, or NBC. For the first time, Citizens of California and New York could listen to the same programming at the same time. Regional differences began to dissolve as the influence of network broadcasting grew. Americans listened to the same sporting events and took up the same fans. Baseball games and boxing matches could now reach those far away from the stadiums and arenas. A mass national entertainment culture was flowering. Syndicated radio programs like Amos and Andy, which began in the late 1920s, entertained listeners around the country. In the case of the popular Amos and Andy, it did so with racial stereotypes about African Americans, familiar from minstrel shows of the previous century. No longer were small corners of the country separated by their access to information. With the radio, Americans from coast to coast could listen to the same programming. This had the effect of smoothing out regional differences in dialect, language, music, and even consumer taste. Radio also changed how Americans enjoyed sports. Announcers started sharing live play-by-play -play of games over the radio. And millions of people could now share in the games as they happened. Radio helped to make new sports heroes. Jim Thorpe was known as one of the best athletes in the world. He won medals at the 1912 Olympic Games, played Major League Baseball, and was one of the first members of the National Football League. Other sports stars became famous. 
1926, Gertrude Ederly became the first woman to swim the English Channel. Helen Wills was the uh, great women's tennis player, winning Wimbledon eight times in the 1920s. And Big Bill Tilden won the national title every year from 1920 to 1925. In football, Harold Redgrange played for the University of Illinois. The biggest star of all was the Sultan of Swat, Babe Ruth, who became America's first baseball hero. He changed the game of baseball. Before Babe Ruth, most, most games had low scores. But Babe Ruth hit so many home runs that baseball became much more fun to watch. In 1924, he hit 60 home runs. Radio made the first national fads. Without a way to share live events, fads were only shared with people who lived in one small area. There were many kinds of fads in the 1920s. One of the most popular was the dance marathon. In a normal dance marathon, people would dance for 45 minutes and rest for 15. The longest dance marathons lasted 36 hours or more. Beauty pageants also became popular. The first Miss America pageant was held in Atlantic City in 1921. One of the most strange fads was flagpole sitting. The goal was simple. Be the person who could sit on the top of a flagpole for the longest time. 15-year-old Avon Foreman sat on a flagpole for 10 days, 10 hours, 10 minutes, and 10 seconds. Sitting on a flagpole doesn't cost very much, but many Americans had more money in the 1920s than they did in the years before, so they could pay for entertainment. As movies became more popular, movie theaters opened in major cities. A ticket for two movies and a live show costs 25 cents. In a time before television, people of all ages went to the movies more often than today, sometimes more than once each week. The silent movies of the early 1920s created the first generation of movie stars. Rudolph Valentino and Clara Bow were two of the first movie stars. However, no star was more famous than Charlie Chaplin. This tramp with sad eyes and mustache, with big pants and a cane was the top star of his time. 1927, the world of the silent movie ended when the first talkie, the jazz singer, came out. This movie, which starred Al Jolson, told a very American story of the 1920s. It follows the life of a Jewish man as he becomes a famous jazz singer. Both the story and the new sound technology used to present it were popular with people around the country. It quickly became a huge hit for Warner Brothers, one of the big five motion picture studios in Hollywood, along with 20th Century Fox, RKO Pictures, Paramount Pictures, and Metro Golden White Mayor, or MGM. Southern California in the 1920s had only recently become a center for the American film industry. Filmmaking was first based in and around New York, where Thomas Edison first showed the kinetoscope in 1893. When D.W. Griffith filmed Old California in 1910, the first movie ever shot in Hollywood, California, a small town north of Los Angeles, was little more than a village. As movie makers moved to Southern California, Hollywood grew. California offered sunshine and many natural film sets, the ocean, the desert, mountains, palm trees, and forests, were all easy to get to from Hollywood. In the 1920s, the one small village was home to a great industry. Animators also found the 1920s a good time. Short, animated films were popular in movie theaters during this time. The late 1920s saw the start of Walt Disney and his studio. Mickey Mouse made his start in Steamboat Willie on November 18, 1928. Mickey would go on to star in more than 120 cartoons. This jump started Walt Disney Studios and led him to draw many other characters in the 1930s. 1937, Disney released Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the first long animated movie. Let's switch now away from movies. Take a look at the music of the 1920s. One of America's great gifts to the world of music was jazz. It started in the late 1800s and early 1900s as African Americans mixed old European music with African and slave songs. Although jazz grew over time, it became popular in the 1920s. Jazz comes in many forms, but it is known for swing and blue notes, call and answer, different rhythms, and improvisation. The style of music that came before jazz was ragtime, with musicians like Scott Joplin turning out songs for piano that many people liked at the turn of the century. Jazz first appeared in New Orleans, 
in the early 1900s. Then, after World War I, large numbers of jazz musicians moved from New Orleans to the big northern cities, such as Chicago and New York, and jazz was heard by more people. Different styles of jazz developed in different cities. Because people listened to jazz in nightclubs where alcohol was sold during Prohibition, and because people could listen to jazz on records and the radio, jazz became very popular in a short time. New jazz stars included Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, and Chick Webb. Places to listen to jazz like the Apollo Theater and the Cotton Club became symbols of the 1920s. And the name the Jazz Age is used to talk about the 1920s. Dances such as the Charleston, developed by African Americans, became popular among different people, including among young whites in the cities. At the start of radio broadcasts in 1922, Americans were able to experience different kinds of music without going to jazz clubs in the cities. Sadly, because of racial prejudice, most radio stations played songs by white jazz artists more than black jazz artists, such as Louis Armstrong or Jelly Roll Morton. Several famous female musicians also became popular during the 1920s, including Bessie Smith, who's a great jazz singer and a black woman. It was not until the 1930s and 40s, however, that female jazz and blues singers such as Smith, Ella Fitzgerald, and Billie Holiday were respected in the music industry. We talked already in our class about women in America, and the last time we focused on women in history, we were learning about the 19th Amendment and winning the right to vote. People like Carrie Chapman Cadd and Alice Paul had given up so much to win voting rights. To their surprise, young women in the jazz age seemed like they did not care about these things. During the 1920s, many young women of the age wanted to have fun, and so were born the flappers. Flappers were single, young, middle-class women. They were from the North and lived in the cities. The Gilded Age gave women many new jobs to choose from. There were jobs working in offices, and an increase in phone usage needed people as operators to connect all those calls being placed. With more people making, selling, and buying things in the 1920s, there were also jobs for young women in department stores. Those jobs needed women to interact with customers, other women. But the flapper was not all work and no play. By night, flappers liked to go out. They went to jazz clubs and vaudeville shows. Speakeasies were places flappers liked to go as the new uh, women of the 1920s showed that they cared as much about prohibition as men. More young women drank alcohol after it was illegal than they ever did before. Smoking, something else that only men did, became popular among flappers. Women also wanted to end social double standards. The flappers were less shy about sex than women in the past. Psychologist Sigmund Freud had just written about how enjoying sex was normal, and flappers felt more free about things to explore. The flappers did not like the style of their mothers, who were dressed in the Gibson girl look. The Gibson girl was a style that was famous because of drawings of Charles Dana Gibson. This picture of the perfect woman had an hourglass shape, held in tight with a corset, more dress with a high neck, full length arms, and a long dress all the way down to the floor. The Gibson girl's hair was pinned up. The flapper said no to everything the Gibson girl, the Gibson girl look. The young women cut their hair shoulder length short. Dresses only went to the knee. Makeup companies grew as women used makeup in large numbers. Flappers wore high-heeled shoes, left corsets behind, and wore clothes with straight lines instead of curves. Many women loved the age of the flapper. They tried out new looks, jobs, and ways of living that set them free from the old rules of the Victorian age of the 1800s. The flappers made choices that they wanted to, did not listen to their fathers or husbands. The flappers were not all good. The political wins, like the right to vote, were not interesting to the flappers. And women did not work on winning new rights until the 1960s. Let's broaden our perspective a little bit and look at both young men as well as young women. We have a word for this group of people today, teenagers. But there was no such thing as a teenager before the 1920s. In the 1800s, the American world was made up of children and adults. Most Americans tried their best to let their children enjoy their youth while slowly preparing them to be adults. Some children still had to work, but many states passed laws that stopped children from working. The average number of years spent in school for young Americans went up. Parents waited longer before they told their children to get married. It was clear that a new time in life had arrived. 
being a teenager. American teens were different from children and adults, and being a teenager was something that started in the 1920s. The car was the single greatest thing that made teenagers free from their families. In earlier times, young boys and girls spent their first dates at home where the boy would meet the girl's parents. They would sit in the house, followed by dinner with the whole family. Later at night, the couple might enjoy a few minutes alone outside. After a few times together, they could get lucky to be able to walk alone through town. The car changed the old ways. Parents did not watch over their children anymore. Ideas about privacy and sex changed all over America. Also, because of the car, teens were able to date people from outside their small towns. Cars also helped lead to another uh, new idea, the consolidated high school, where many teacher, uh, teenagers from all over studied together. Buses were able to take students far from their homes. Also, Americans knew that learning more was important, and students started going to school for more years than in the past. Before long, schools created new things that were different from the things for children and adults, such as school athletics and extracurricular activities. We'll finish today by ta taking a look at art and architecture of the 20s. Art Deco was a popular style in art and architecture in the 1920s. Started in Europe, it spread throughout Western Europe and North America in the mid-1920s, and was popular throughout the 1930s and into the 1940s. The name is short for Arts Decoratifs, which came from the French architect named Le Corbusier. The new style was born between World War I and World War II, a time called the interwar period, and put together old styles with new styles that were inspired by machines. Art Deco used rich colors, detailed and geometric shapes. New York City's Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building are examples of the Art Deco style from that time. Other American examples can be found in Chicago, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. The Hoover Dam, built between 1931 and 1936 on the border between Nevada and Arizona, includes Art Deco art throughout the dam. Art Deco was not only used in buildings, artists used Art Deco in ads, posters, and other arts also. Surrealism was another new idea that began in the early 1920s. Surrealist works had things that were strange, out of place, or put together things that did not match. Spanish painter Salvador Dali, best known for his 1931 work, The Persistence of Memory, was one of the most famous artists who used surrealism. As with many other areas of life, Americans were excited about trying new things and new ways of seeing the world through art and just another way of having a good time. That concludes this lesson about the exciting popular culture of the 1920s. I close by recapping our big ideas. During the 1920s, as more and more Americans had electricity, radio became an important form of entertainment. For the first time, Americans could all listen to the same radio shows or listen to live sports broadcasts. Fads such as flagpole sitting, dance marathons, and beauty pageants became popular across the nation. New kinds of art and entertainment became, pop became popular. Jazz was a new American form of music. It became popular in the 1920s. Based on old African-American musical traditions, jazz became popular in the North and among white audiences. Hollywood and the music industry were born in the 1920s. The first movies had no sound, but eventually talkies were invented. Walt Disney started making animated movies, and new forms of art included art deco and surrealism. Expectations for young people changed significantly. High schools added sports, extracurricular activities, and many young Americans waited longer to get married or start working. Some young women called flappers embraced a new style of clothing and broke social rules about behavior. Thank you very much. When I see you next time, we'll be talking about African Americans and the amazing Harlem Renaissance. Till then, study hard, or maybe you can take a break to learn the Charleston.